now know what city is truly the city of champions. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, bari al-khalaqi ajma'een, ba'ath al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen. Thumma salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa khatam al-nabiyyin, sayyidina wa nabiyyina wa habib qulubina wa tabib nufusina, al-mustafa bil-qasim Muhammad. وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن أحسن قولا مما دعا إلى الله مما دعا وقال إنني من المسلمين ولا تستوي الحسنة ولا السيئة ادفع بالتي هي أحسن فإذا الذي بينك وبينه عداوة فإذا الذي بينك وبينه وما يلقاها إلا الذين صبروا وما يلقاها إلا ذو حظ عظيم وإما من الشيطان نزغ فاستعن بالله إنه هو السميع العليم صدق الله Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad First of all, we'd like to convey our congratulations to Imam Sahib al-Asri wa-Zaman Ajjal Allah Ta'ala Farajah al-Sharif on this blessed occasion of the birth of the man who the Holy Quran terms as Rahmah للعالمين or a mercy to the whole universe the prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم اللهم صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم and also on the birth of the master of the madhab Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq صلى الله عليه وسلم so indeed when we take a look at the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the Imams, peace be upon them, we don't really realize how much they have done to us and how much they have given us. 
and how much indebted we are to them. Imagine if a person is financially in debt. Imagine if a person has got $100,000 debt. And then another man comes and says, you know what, I'm paying it all for you, everything. I'm going to save you from all this debt. How much gratitude would you have towards this individual who just saved your life, saved your family? And this is from financial. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wadhkuru ni'mat Allah alaykum, idh kuntum a'da'an fa'allafa bayna qulubikum, fa'asbahtum bi ni'matihi ikhwana, wa kuntum ala shafa hufratim min al-nar fa'anqadakum minha. And remember the ni'mah, the blessing of Allah upon you when you were enemies and he united amongst yourselves, amongst you. He united your hearts. So you've become with his grace, with his ni'mah, brothers and sisters. A society which was completely nomadic. A society that had no values, no merits, and hence people who had any sort of merit or value were recognized immediately in that society. For example, a man by the name of Hatam Atta'i. Hatam Atta'i was known for his generosity. Why? Because there was no generosity. So a man excelled in that character or that characteristic and hence he became famous for it. Hatam Atta'i. Antara ibn Shaddad was famous for his bravery, a valor. Because a society was a society of deception. A society where if one person or one tribe grows in strength, it goes and attacks the neighboring tribe. Lack of security. Allah tells Quraysh, which was the only tribe that was immune from this, in the sense that Allah provided it with security because of the Kaaba. So tribes would not attack Quraysh because of the Kaaba. Because even in Jahiliya, they revered Kaaba. It had some reverence. And hence, if you read Surah Quraysh, Allah says, فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ الَّذِي أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ وَأَمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفٍ let them worship the Lord of this house, of the house, who fed them from hunger and who provided them with security. There was no fear in Quraysh. They did not fear. Otherwise, all the other tribes, they were in constant fear. That kind of life of animosity, that kind of life where you find two tribes fighting for literally decades. Why? Because a goat of one tribe went into the land of another tribe and ate from their grass. And so there is a huge fight that goes on for centuries and decades just because of this incident. So that mentality all of a sudden gets transformed 180 degrees where a migrant would come to a supporter, a person in Medina, and the migrant has nothing but his clothes doesn't own anything. He left everything behind. And just because Rasulullah sallallahu establishes a brotherhood, this person from Medina would come to a complete stranger, a man who he has not met before. But he says, now you are my brother. I'm going to share my wealth with you. I'm going to share my estate with you, my business. And all of a sudden you have this sort of sacrifice. And hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the Ansar, the people of Medina, where he says, وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصَةً They sacrifice even when they have the need for this money. They still sacrifice. They give. And this tells us, my dear brothers and sisters, in the truly Islamic society, especially the one that follows the madhab of Ahlul Bayt, there should not be a single poor person. Because in a truly Islamic society, I mean, that's the first thing Rasulullah recognized when he was building the society. People of Quraysh are coming, they don't have jobs, they don't have homes. I mean, they're migrants. I mean, a lot of people sitting down here are migrants. Think of the day that you just arrived into this land, foreign land, stranger place, you may not know anybody, and maybe you don't even have much money on you. Like they say, I came in with $20 in my pocket. That's the, the saying. 
So in that status, how would a person feel? Where would they start from? Rasulullah realized to establish a successful society, people should not be unemployed, sitting down, not knowing what to do, sleeping on the street. And hence he divided the wealth. He said there should be, the wealth should be shared. In other words, in a truly Shia or Islamic society, people who have should give to those who don't have, even if it's loans. Loans so that they can stand on their feet and raise them. There should not be a single poor person. And when there is, it's sad. In fact, it should be a shame. Because when Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallallahu alayhi, as the famous story goes, when he was the Khalifa and he saw that poor person begging on the street, and he said, what is this? Why would there be a person begging in the streets during my Khilafah? And they told him, well, ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, he is not a Muslim. He said, so what? If he is in the Muslim world, he's living in the Muslim state, he should be treated with respect. And so he orders the Minister of Treasury to provide him with a house and a salary that would feed him and his family. So this is the truly Islamic akhlaq and the Islamic doctrine. So what Rasulullah did, he provided this to the society. Now this society that used to fight, all of a sudden started sharing, sacrificing. And then Allah says, and you are about to fall into the hellfire. And Allah saved you from it. Through who? Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam in her sermon. She says to the people in Medina, in the Prophet's mosque, when she delivered that beautiful sermon of hers, she said, وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَىٰ شَفَىٰ حُفْرَةٍ مِنَ النَّارِ فَأَنْقَذَكُمُ اللَّهُ بِأَبِي مُحَمَّدٍ صلى الله عليه محمد وعلى محمد you were about to fall into the hellfire, but Allah saved you through my father. And hence, this is how much debt we have to this great man. He transformed us from being people who are arrogant, uneducated, to people who, alhamdulillah, now, until today, until today, about maybe three, four years ago, there is an American magazine called Newsweek. In that magazine, they did a survey of the Muslims in America. And they found that Muslims in America, on average, they earn more than the average American do, does. And on average, they are more educated than the average American, in general. All this is actually indebted to Rasulullah. When the Prophet started, he came, there were literally, I think, seven or eight people who could read or write. In all of Arabia, Will Durant, who has written the story of civilizations, he's got a book, you can borrow it from the library. The story of civilizations, he names them. Seven or ten people, now I can't remember the exact number, but about ten people who could read or write in all of Arabia. Shortly after the message when the Prophet migrated to Medina, that number transferred, like, transferred to 700. And we're talking about a few years here. The Prophet stayed in Mecca 13 years and then in Medina for another, you know, 10 years or so. 23 years in total. That's it. So within this short time, the number, you know, is multiplied almost 100 times, 70 times. So that's the transformation. I heard from one of the Iranian scholars. He says, even if we take a look at Iran, Yes, Iran was a civilization before Islam, indeed. He said, but if we take a look at the number of scholars, philosophers, who were there before Islam versus those who were there after Islam, he says there's a huge difference. After Islam, we have so many more scholars. And the same thing we find in all over the places. Wherever Islam went, it spread education, it gave and gave and hence so many countries like Indonesia, Malaysia. Indonesia today is the biggest Islamic population, the biggest Muslim population today. No wars were fought. They became Muslims willingly by trade, through trade, and through what they saw that Islam has to offer to them. 
So all is all is this all indebted to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The man who Allah subhanahu wa taala says has we have sent you, but as a mercy, rahma, alami. Now how did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam manage to transfer this entire nation or that society 180 degrees? Allah subhanahu wa taala gives us some points in this surah, surah Fussilat. And in these verses that we just recited, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 33, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مَنْ مَنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ And who is better than the one who calls to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Okay, now he calls to Allah. What else does he do? وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا His actions are also good. وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ So there are three things. The one who has a good speech and a good talk. First of all, he himself is calling to Allah, da'a ila Allah. وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ He himself works on himself. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before he becomes a messenger, he used to go to Ghar Hira, that mountain. You know, I don't know how many of you have been to Jabal al-Nur, or at least been by it. You know, the place is quite dangerous to go up there, you know, nowadays. If, uh, this is in this day and age, it's quite dangerous. Imagine, we're talking 1400 years ago. The Prophet used to go up that mountain and there worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for days and nights. And sometimes he would take with him Amir al Mu'mineen, sallallahu alayhi where he would also go with him and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and until today, all Muslims agree, Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallallahu alayhi never worshipped an idol. Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallallahu alayhi was a muwahid. And hence, the other Muslims, they call, when they say Ali ibn Abi Talib, they say, Karram Allahu wajhah. May Allah bless his face. Because his face never did sujood to Asanam. He only did sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is agreed upon by all Muslims. The Prophet used to go there in preparation for this message that's going to come to him. And everything he does to the Muslims, he does it to himself before he does it to the Muslims. One day, Fatima Zahra came to her father while they were digging the trenches in the battle of the Khandaq. They were preparing the trenches. And she brought him some food. He ate that food and he said, Ya Fatima. This is the first bite your father takes in three days. He have not had anything to eat for three days. And he's digging with the Muslims. He's not the sort of, 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 of leader who sits down and says, do this and do that. He himself gets in and builds and does and acts. When a person does this, my dear brothers and sisters, for the sake of Allah, then his words become more emphatic. They carry more value. Scholars today, they say, um, the Shia scholars, they say what comes from the heart enters the heart. When the words are spoken from the person's heart, they go right into the person's heart. That's why you hear some people, some of our ulama, when they talk, you feel what they're saying. They actually live what they say. Whereas, for example, sometimes you have people like Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan sometimes also used to give lectures as well. He used to admonish people to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all this. Al Hajjaj used to give lectures. Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al Thaqafi as well. But you take a look at his actions, they're absolutely the opposite of what he says. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you need to do the good action, good deeds, amal salih And you need to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's when you call people. You call people to come to the religion. Which kind of tells us, my dear brothers and sisters, how many of us actually do this? How many of us do the amal salih on a regular basis? How many of, our, how, how many of us actually submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَسْتَوِي الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا السَّيِّئَةُ Good manners are not equivalent to bad manners. Good actions are not equivalent to bad actions. So when a person is making a call, inviting 
his actions, he has to look after them. He has to make sure that he is perfect, at least to the best he can. I mean, our Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we know for sure he is perfect. He is a ma'asum, infallible, from his creation. We have a hadith at the age of three, when he was with his nursing mother, Halima. At the age of three, he asked his nursing mother, Halima, he said, where do your children go every day? I see them going outside. She said they go to take care of the sheep, the shepherds. He said, I want to go with them. She said, no problem. Tomorrow you can go with them. She gave him a necklace with some protection on it, you know, some writing on it. He said, what is this necklace for? This is at the age of three. She said, this is to protect you. He took it off and he said, there is the one who protects me. There is the one who protects me. I don't need this necklace. This is at the age of three. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, and all prophets, they are infallible, ma'asumeen. They don't make a mistake, nor do they commit a sin, wal'iyadu billah. Completely infallible. And hence, but this is more to us. When we are following the path of Ahlul Bayt السلام, that's how we should be. And then Allah says, إِدْفَعْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَانٍ فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ Whenever a person does something that hurts you, that bothers you, Quran is telling us, do not do the same back. Be, for, be forgiving. Be somebody who's kind. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam demonstrated that the pinnacle of this. This Hatam al Ta'i that I spoke of earlier, he was pre Islam. When one day Muslims they had a fight with that same tribe and they brought his daughter, Hatam's daughter was brought as a prisoner. Sufana her name was. She was brought as a prisoner to Rasulullah. The Prophet, peace be upon him, looked at her and she said, Ya Rasulullah, I am the daughter of Hatam al Ta'i. My father was very generous. He used to give to the poor, he used to help the one who needs help. He was kind and merciful and compassionate. He said to her, these are the characteristics of the believers. And because of this, because of your father and his generosity, he ordered the Muslims, let her go, free her, and see whatever she wants, give to her. So she went back and met with her brother, Adi or Uday ibn Hatam al Ta'i. He asked her, he said, how did you find him? Because her brother actually ran away. So they did not capture him. He ran away then until his sister came back. He came back to her. She said, I have seen a man who is so gracious and so kind that I think if you meet him, you'll fall in love with him. So he goes to meet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he becomes a mu'min. He says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa annaka muhammad rasulullah. And he actually becomes one of the Shia, one of the followers of Amir al-Mu'mineen. He fights next to Amir al-Mu'mineen and then he stays next to Imam al-Hassan. And he dies shortly after Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. So he was one of the followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, the Su'day ibn Hatam al-Ta'i. And then on the day of the conquest of Mecca, this my dear brothers and sisters is something that we need to spread around because I don't think many people are aware of it, even the Muslims unfortunately. On the conquest of Mecca, the year 8 after Hijrah, the Prophet, peace be upon him, marches back on Mecca. Now these are the people who fought against him for eight years since he traveled to the Medina and then 13 years beforehand. They killed his uncle Al-Hamza. They killed his companions. Now how would a person deal with such people when he captures them? First of all, the Prophet did not want to cause any bloodshed. So he tells the Muslims, and there were about 10,000 of them, 10,000 of them, they march towards Mecca. He says, we're going to approach Mecca at night. We're going to go closer to Mecca at night. And he says, every one of you, I want to carry a torch. 
every one of you, I want you to carry a torch. Why? So that when the spies, when the people are looking from Mecca to Quraysh to see how many Muslims are there, you know, can they fight against them? Can they actually win this war? What happened is the person, those people came and they saw there was a flood of fire, torches. So they went back to their people, to Quraysh, and they said, we have no chance. There is no chance of defeating the Muslims. We better surrender. So the plan of Rasulullah works successfully. Quraysh surrenders. Then one of the Muslims, the Prophet gives him the banner and he says, go tell Quraysh that we are coming in. So what he does, he says, today is the day of the revenge. Today Quraysh will fall as prisoners to the Muslims. The news reaches Rasulullah, he becomes very upset and he says, come back here. Why is it the day of the day of revenge? This is nonsense. So he gives the banner to Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallamullahi alayhi, and says, Ya Ali, you go and deliver the message. So Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen goes in, and he says, today is the day of mercy. Today is when Quraysh will be protected by the Muslims. And hence, Rasulullah comes in, and he says, anyone who does not raise the sword to come and fight us is in peace and security. He gathers all of Quraysh, including the heads, including those some famous figures, some famous individuals. We don't want to mention names here, but very well-known people. And he gathers them all and he says, what do you think I'm about to do with you here? After all that you have done. They said, Akhun Kareem wa Akhin Kareem, an honorable man coming from an honorable family. He says, indeed. So go, I have forgiven you all. You're all forgiven. This is the akhlaq of Rasulullah. Now, where do we find this in history? Where do we find other than Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamullahi alayhi, and Ahlul Bayt? Who else does this? Where do we find in history any general who manages to take control of people who have fought against him and he forgives them all? Where? Where do we find such akhlaq? Yes, Amir al-Mu'mineen has that akhlaq. In the Battle of Safin, against Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, Muawiyah first con seizes control of the water, of the river, and he prevents the army of Imam Ali from reaching the water, just like what they did in Karbala, the same thing. You can tell the family, mashallah, one after the other, same. So Imam Ali then goes with his army, with some men, and they manage to take control back of the water, of the river. So his men say, well, let us stop Muawiyah's men now from drinking the water. We'll pay them back the same. He said, no, that's not our akhlaq. We're not fighting for the water. Let them have access to the water like we have access to the water. We're fighting for haqq, justice. This is the akhlaq of Amir al mumin This is the akhlaq of Ahlul Bayt. Imam Hussein alayhi salam on the day of Ashura, when al hurr ibn Yazid al riyahi comes to him, and he says, Ya Aba Abdullah, I am the one who brought you here. I am the one who brought your family here. I'm the one who's responsible. But now I am seeking tawbah. Fahalli min tawbah? No, Hussein says, In tawbah to tawbah Allahu alayk. If you're seeking tawbah, then I forgive you and Allah will forgive you. And he becomes one of the first martyrs in Karbala. This is the akhlaq of Ahlul Bayt. Akhlaq of Ahlul Bayt is this. Now, how are our akhlaq in that sense? How are we or how do we compare with Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam Quran says when a person does bad to you, do not turn it back, do not return it. Have mercy, have compassionate. Show them good manners. And you'll find that individual will become your friend, a close friend. Indeed. The akhlaq of Rasulullah is what made people, as we read in Surah Al-Nasr, يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا أَفْوَاجًا Why? Because the akhlaq of Rasulullah. When they saw Rasulullah with such great manners, such great akhlaq, attracted Muslims. A man came to Imam Al-Baqir, Salamullahi Alayhi, and he insulted his mother right in front of him. He looks at him and he says, إِنْ كَانَتْ كَذَلِكْ غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَهَا وَإِنْ لَمْ تَكُونْ غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَكَ 
if she were like that, as you're saying, then may Allah forgive her. And if she weren't, if she wasn't, then may Allah forgive you. He's saying, may Allah forgive you, the man who's just insulted his mother. He's praying for him. And then when this man saw this, he said, Allahu a'lam haythu yaj'al risalatah. Allah knows best whom he chooses to carry his message. Indeed. This is the akhlaq of Ahlul Bayt. This is how they treated with or dealt with their enemies. Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Now this man is a very interesting character. Very interesting. He was one of the initiators of the battle of Al-Jamal with Talha and Zubair and that famous lady. All against Amiyam Ali ibn Abi Talib. He was one of the people fighting against in the battle of Jamal. When the battle of Jamal ended, he approached Imam Hassan and Hussein السلام, and he said, ask your father to forgive me. Shafa'a, do shafa'a for me. So Imam Al-Hassan went to his father and said, Marwan is asking for forgiveness. Imam Ali السلام, told them, go tell him that we will forgive him. But tell him he's going to be a troublemaker. You know, we won't, you know, he's going to continue to do trouble, doing trouble. But we'll forgive him. And indeed, he was there after when they brought the head of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he was also there. And he started beating the head of Imam Hussein alayhi salam with a stick. This is Marwan. And he started insulting the family of Rasulullah. Now, the second year after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, Yazid ibn Muawiyah sends an army to Medina to raid Medina, all of Medina. And he says, you have, he told his army, you have the right to invade every house you want, do whatever you want. They stole, they killed, they murdered, they attacked women. It is said 1,000 women were raped. 1,000 in Medina, Medina Rasulullah. The only house that Yazid ibn Muawiyah said is immune is the house of Ali ibn, Ali ibn al Hussein. He said, only his house. We've done enough to his father. So him, don't. Leave him alone. But every other house is free. Including Marwan ibn al-Hakam's house. Who was also from Bani Uway. He was also not immune. So what he does, he takes his family and brings them to Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam. He knocks at his door. He said, Ya ibn Rasulullah, can you please take my family as refugees, you know, for a few days? I'm going to go out of town. When everything settles, I'll come back. And Imam Sajjah says, come on in. Tfadl. Welcome. And he takes the family of Marwan. He goes, comes back after a few days. He takes his family back. And he asks them, he says, how did he deal with you? The lady said, whenever he brought clothes, he would actually give us first the clothes and then to his family. When they lay out the food, he tells us to eat first, and then his family would come and eat. Whatever he gave his family, he would give us as well. This is the akhlaq of Ahlul Bayt with their enemies. Their enemies. How are our akhlaq with our Shia, with our followers? Do we have the same manners when we deal with one another? Same akhlaq when we interact with one another? This is how Rasulullah had. And the Quran tells us, if shaitan tries to prevent you from having such akhlaq, فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ Say, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Don't make shaitan contaminate your mind and your heart. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, Ya Mu'mineen, take the Prophet as a role model. Look at the way he behaved and how he attracted people to Islam. Do the same and respect one another and that's how you attract people to Islam. That is the akhlaq of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu wa salamuhu alayh A man one day comes to him and he says, Yabna Rasulillah, I have so much debt, so much debt. I am indebted to the government 
He comes from a city in Iran called Abadan. He said, Ibn Rasulullah, I was a big businessman, but I lost everything. I don't know, credit crunch or financial crunch, whatever happened back in those days. Everything is gone. And now I'm in debt. 400,000 dinars. 400,000 dinars back in those days. Huge sum of money. He said, I have nothing. Help me. What can I do? Imam al-Sadiq writes a note. He says, take this note to the governor of Abadan. He'll take care of you. He takes it and goes back. He arrives and there's a guard standing there. The guard says, yes. He says, go tell the governor that I have a message to him from Ja'far ibn Muhammad al sadiq Allah sallallahu alayhi the governor, the man, the guard goes. All of a sudden, a few moments later, they find the governor coming out, running barefoot. He says, you have a message to me from Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq. He says, yes. Turn out that the governor was actually a Shia, but he was hiding his faith. He says, come on in. He brings him in. He makes him sit right next to him. He says, where is the message? He says, here it is. He picks it up, he reads it. Imam al-Sadiq has written, إِنَّ لِلَّهِ ظِلًّا تَحْتَ عَرْشِهِ لَا يُسْتَظَلُّ بِهِ إِلَّا مَنْ قَضَى لِأَخِيهِ حَاجَةِ أَوْ نَفَّسَ عَنْهُ كُرْبَةِ أَوْ أَدْخَلَ السُّرُورَ إِلَىٰ قَلْبِهِ Allah has a special place reserved in Jannah, under His throne, to one of three types of people. One who fulfills a need to his mu'min brother. Two, the one who does a favor to his mu'min brother. Three, the one who brings pleasure to the heart of his mu'min brother. Does a favor, one who fulfills a need, and one who brings the pleasure to the heart of a mu'min. These three characteristics. That's when the governor takes a look at this man. He says, apparently you have some need before me. He said, yes. He said, what do you need? He said, I am indebted to your government with 400,000 dinars. So the governor says, bring me the books. So the treasurer brings the books. Yes, Mr. Treasurer? Where are you? He's good, alhamdulillah. Inshallah. Inshallah. I know khujas are very good with books. So he brings the books. He takes a look at them. He says, yes, I see, yes, you do actually owe us 400,000 dinars. Back in those days, they used to write with wet ink. So what this governor does, he takes his saliva and he wipes it off. He says, khalas, your debt is done, finish. He said, khalas, that's it? He said, yes. Because you brought me a message from my master, Ja'far ibn Muhammad ibn al-Sadiq. Allahu Akbar. This is how much love we should have to Ahlul Bayt alayhim wassalam. But I wonder how much do we actually love Ahlul Bayt. So the man says, while well, I was about to get up, I mean, my loan is finished, alhamdulillah. He says, no, 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 stay, wait. He calls upon his minister again. He says, I want you to count my wealth, how much money I have, personal money. So the minister Counts it and he says, for example, you got this much money. He says, divide it in half. Half you give to this man and half you keep to myself. They do that. He says, then I want you to count how much estate, land I have. Divide it in half, give half of it to this man and keep the other half. Then he calls upon all his servants, the slaves, the maids, the servants. Divide them in half. Half you give to him and half you keep to myself. And finally the man says, well, thank you very much. So this governor asked him, are you pleased? Are you happy? The man said, I am more than happy. No, I never expected this much. He says, well, as long as you are happy, that's good. He said, you brought me something very precious. You brought me a message written by my master, Ja'far ibn Muhammad ibn al-Sadiq. Salaamu Allahi alayhi. Allahumma salli ala. 
So all this is very little. All this that I have done is very little. The man says, I got up to leave. He told me, even this rug you were sitting on, this rug, even this, take it with you. That's yours as well. He says, I entered the minister's home being the poorest man in the city. I left being one of the richest men in the city. Then I went back a year later to visit Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam and I told him of what had happened. Then he said, I asked him, I said, Ya ibn Rasulillah, whatever that governor did, did it please you? He said, not only did he please me, he pleased my grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Not only did he please my grandfather, he said he pleased Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is how much love, that's how much we should be, my dear brothers and sisters, when we interact with one another, when we deal with one another. As mu'mineen, as followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as salam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam had the supporters, had the helpers. Through his akhlaq, he managed to attract them. In order to establish such a change in the society, people, first of all, have to be willing to change. The change has to come from within. There are no miracles. I mean, I, I say to people sometimes, you know, when they bring me some youth, you know, and they say, for example, this youth at the age of 19, 20, and he needs help. A father or a mother would bring him to me. They say, well, have you been teaching him to pray? No. He, have you been taking him to center? No. I told them, well, don't expect me to have Musa's cane, you know, Asa Musa, and I do miracles here. I can't. Things start from the little, childhood. That's when you start raising this child, not at this stage. But the change has to come from within oneself, from within the community. This change what could make a person like Abu Dhar al-Ghafari become Abu Dhar al-Ghafari. Abu Dhar al-Ghafari used to be a thief. A thief. You know, he used to cut people's path. You know, when the people, caravans used to come in the desert, he would steal. Cut them off, intercept them, and steal from them. That was the job of Abu Dhar al-Ghafari. Until he listened to the message of Rasulullah. Then he transformed. 180 degrees to become one wali of awliya Allah salihi a man whom the prophet says there is no man who is more truthful than Abu Dhar al-Ghafari who is living on this earth today of course after Rasulullah and Ahlul Bayt from the companions this is Abu Dhar al-Ghafari why because he was willing to change how come the others didn't do achieve that status they didn't want to he wanted to change and hence, my dear brothers and sisters, the change has to come from within. So tonight, being a holy night, Sheikh Abbas Qummi in Mafatiho Jinan says, This Layla, this Eve, Laylatun Sharifatun Jiddan. It's a very holy night. So on this holy night, when Rasulullah, the Eve of the Wilada of this man who is a Rahmatu the Alameen, let us go home, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us this change from within such that we become among the mu'mineen, the muttaqeen. But not only pray for it, let us actually put it in action. You know how they say every new year, they say you put new year resolution? You know, a lot of people say I will lose so many weights, so much weight, you know, this is my new year's revol resolution. Okay. Well, this year let us lose some of the arrogance. Let us lose some of our bad habits, our selfishness, let us lose this. This should be our resolution for the year. How to be, have the akhlaq of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. Only then can we succeed as a community. Only then when we start helping one another can we become successful. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. No miracles are there. The nation of Rasulullah, when they started sacrificing, they became successful. They started winning the Battle of Badr. They won the Battle of Khandaq. They won the Battle of Khaybar. How? When they started to give and give and sacrifice. Then they became successful. However, if we leave that, then 
no more success in dunya and no success in akhirah either والعياذ بالله so we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to the sarat al-mustaqeem we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the sincere followers of Ahlul Bayt. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who forgive and forget and move on. Especially our mu'mineen brothers and sisters. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our lives the lives of Ahlul Bayt. And make us die the death of Ahlul Bayt. Resurrect us with Ahlul Bayt and grant us the shafa'ah of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Barakat al-salat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. اللهم صل على